Hi, everyone, and welcome to our November 2021 Albany Pine Bush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community. As always, we co-sponsor with Commission staff our monthly science lectures. Today's program, Science in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve, is a recap of the 2021 field season. Uh, and today, we're happy that our very own Amanda Dillon will be the presenter. For questions, which we love, we encourage you to use the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. And Dylan will get your questions uh, at the end, and but add them whenever you think of them so we don't lose them. Today, since Dylan usually introduced the speaker, I get the honor since she is the speaker. Uh, Dylan grew up in farm country in Northern Central New York, catching salamanders, collecting cicada skins, raising monarchs from caterpillars, identifying trees with her dad and listening to bird songs with her mom. Her love of nature carried over into her career, earning her a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural History and Interpretation from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. After spending a summer studying dragonflies and damselflies, she decided to pursue a graduate degree studying insects. Working with Dr. Barb Hager, she earned a master's of science degree in entomology, studying native solitary bees and wasps. She started as a seasonal at the Albany Pine Bush Preserve in 2010. Now as the field ecologist and entomologist, she conducts field research, collecting data on a number of research and monitoring projects while engaging the public in science through such things as tonight's Albany Pine Bush Community Science Program and our series. And now, Dylan. Thanks so much, Richard. And thank awesome. you so much for everybody for joining this evening. Um, it's a pretty diverse presentation, so I hope you enjoy it. And again, like Richard said, if you come up with any questions, because I'm going to cover a lot of material. Um, so if you think of a question, um, because I'm covering a lot of different projects, I'm probably not going to answer it later in the presentation, you know, so uh, if you think of a question, go ahead and put it right in the, the um, Q&A box as you think of it. Um, so I, I've got uh, some other people that made our field season this year possible, um, and that includes uh, Steve Campbell, my coworker. Um, he's the conservation biologist here at the preserve, um, and we kind of tag team the field season. I do the field portion, and he manages all the data, which I think works well for both of us. <laughs> um, and of course, um, our supervisor, the conservation director, Neil Gifford. Um, who advocates and supports this work and also helps us conduct this work in the field as well. Um, but also I have to acknowledge our field crew this year. We had a really great crew. Um, we weren't able to hire anyone last year due to COVID. Um, so it was a bit lonely around um, the office. So it was great to be able to hire a, a team this year and we had a really great team. So um, on the left here, we have Janelle, James, Tori, uh, and Dylan. So these guys did an incredible amount of work for us this season. And just to give you an idea, this is what um, the job description for our conservation science technicians looks like. So we hire these positions uh, every season if we have the funding. Um, and they usually, our field season usually starts in April and goes till about now. So just about like early to mid November. So it's a pretty long season and there's a variety of projects that are covered over the course of that season. So you'll see here mostly in this job description that 80 to 90% of the work is done in the field. Um, so it's a lot of field data collection on a lot of research and monitoring projects that help inform our management and restoration efforts in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. So I'm gonna start with uh, some of the, the bigger ones that you may be more familiar with. Um, so Carner Blue Butterfly, this is our federally endangered species here in the preserve. So we've been doing a, a lot of work, a lot of the work early on um, in the preserve was about restoring and maintaining habitat for this species. Um, and we are successfully doing that. Um, which you'll see in a bit, but the way that we know that we're successfully doing that is that we have 
staff that go out and actually count the butterflies. Um, and to do that, we walk these transects um, that are marked with these red flags, these red stake wire flags. So if you've ever uh, hiked around in the pine bush and seen these stake wire flags and wondered what, what are those? Um, well, this is what they are. They're marking these transects that um, staff walk through the site. Um, so the blue areas on this map are the areas where we survey. The green areas are um, areas where lupin has been planted or existed historically. And this little picture down here in the left kind of demonstrates the method that we use. It's called distance sampling. We've been using it to monitor our corner population since 2007. And it's a really great method because it allows us to come up with population estimates. Um, and the reason we can do that is you walk these lines, which again are marked with those stake wire flags. Um, and they carry these distance poles. And when they see a carner walking, when they, well, the carner's not walking, they're walking. Um, when, when they see a carner as they're walking these transects, um, they record where, how far away that carner was from that central transect line. And so the main assumption of this method is that you see all the butterflies right in front of you. And as you get further and further away from you, away from that central transect, you see less and less and less of the carners. And so what this allows us to do is kind of figure out how many carners we missed. Um, by figuring out the formula for that curve, right? You see all of them right in front of you and you see less and less and less. Um, and Steve also does some other magic um, incorporating uh, flight times for the animals. So we know if we're double counting um, and that we are using those methods, we're able to come up with population estimates. Um, so here is our Carner data for 2007 through 2021. Those teal bars in the background are the area that's sampled. So as we have increased and restored habitat for the Carner, we have increased the amount that we sample. Um, we had a little dip here in 2020 because again, we weren't able to hire seasonal staff and we were doing all of our Carner sampling kind of in-house with permanent staff. We could not cover all of the sites. Um, so we had a little dip here in 2020, um, but with our team we hired this year, we were able to bump back up. Um, and you'll also notice for each year, there's a red dot and a blue dot. So the red dot is the first brood and the blue dot is the second brood. So um, Carners are, um, they have two generations in a year. You'll see the butterflies flying two times over the course of the season. So they start flying in probably like May, mid-May, um, and that is the first brood. And those are the result of eggs that overwintered. Um, they hatch in the spring when the lupin um, breaks bud and starts leafing out. They feed on the lupin, they then pupate, and then they hatch out as adults. And that's our first brood. Those adults will then um, mate, lay eggs, and then there will be another batch of caterpillars that will feed on lupin and pupate. And then we'll get a second um, burst of adult individuals, usually in July. So it's very characteristic. You can see here that our first brood is usually smaller than our second brood, um, likely due to some overwinter mortality. Um, so the other thing that you can notice on this graph is this dotted line. This sits right at 3,000 butterflies, um, and that is the state and federally federal recovery threshold. Um, for this animal in order to be considered recovered, it has to be above 3000 animals in four out of five consecutive years. Um, and you can see here that 2021, wait, let me do the math. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So 2021 is our eighth year that we've had both broods above that um, recovery threshold, which is really great news. Um, you might be questioning this crazy uh, number here in 2020. So are we, <laughs> we're still trying to figure that out. It's not unusual to see insect populations really have these boom years um, and then really have more kind of an up and down fluctuation, which is kind of what we see the rest, uh, what we're seeing now. So we're not really sure what happened in 2020. Of course, it was the year we couldn't monitor them as extensively as we would have preferred. Um, but uh, you can see here, even in 2021, we are still above that recovery threshold and really kind of sitting where we've been sitting for the past five or six years. Uh, in addition, we this year, uh, did another Carner release. So the last year that we did a Carner release was 2015. Um, and we do this as we created habitats because the habitats were so far apart, it was difficult for the Carners to find them on their own or they weren't capable of finding them because Carner adults actually really only fly about 200 meters over the course of their lifetime. So 
We uh, work with New Hampshire Fish and Game. We send uh, gravid females over to New Hampshire. They lay the eggs. They re rear those eggs up to the, the uh, pupa or the chrysalises, and that's what we get back. And then we release those, once those hatch indoors, we release the adults out into sites. Um, and so we haven't done this for a number of years. We did it this year because we have um, a brand new piece of habitat um, that was preserved with both state and fish and wildlife uh, efforts and just recently restored, it was a locust clone. We took out the locust clone in 2018. Um, so it's this, and planted it with lupin and it's really big, beautiful site. Um, and so we wanted to help the carners find it. Um, and so we did another captive release. You may have seen this in some of the, the newspapers locally. We did a pretty big press release about it. Um, but this is what we get back from New Hampshire are these little pupae. Um, and this year we released 290 of these guys. So. This is just a fun thing when they're indoors, it's a little bit cooler indoors, they don't have the sunshine. So I call this the pop. When they get outside, as soon as they feel the warm rays of the sun, they open up their wings. Um, and you, I like to think of those wings as little solar panels that um, are gonna warm up their body temperatures because they actually need to reach a certain body temperature in order to be able to fly. So this is just a fun thing that always happens when you take them outside into the sun. They just all pop their wings um, and then pretty quick, they're ready to go. Um, and this is actually at the release site. So this is some carners getting released actually out at the site. So it can be pretty fun almost, depending on how many you release at a time, we release, um, we re release them every day. So it was um, probably on average about 30 individuals that would be in a net. Um, so sometimes it looked like a little cloud flying out of the nets. Um, so that was really, that was a fun thing that we did this year that we haven't done in a few years. And we're looking forward to monitoring that site next year to see if our um, little efforts um, take and if we see Carners there next year, I'm sure they will. It's a beautiful site. Um, and another, so getting into vegetation a little bit here. So um, we used to, before we would release those carners, we would go out to sites as we restored them and we would try to quantify what the habitat looked like for carners in order to determine if it would be suitable and if it would sustain a population. So we would go out to these sites and we would look at the density of lupin, we would look at the availability of nectar resources for the adults. The caterpillars, while they feed exclusively on wild lupin, the adults are generalists. Um, so they will nectar on a lot of different things. And then we also look at the structure of the habitat um, so that the carners have places to, you know, hide, you know, in the shade on hot days or, um, you know, hide under the shade in a rainy, windy day structure, that vegetation structure is important. Um, so we used to do that when we were regularly releasing as we restored sites. Um, now that we have kind of moved away from that, we're doing a more concerted, eff concerted effort here in six sites. Um, and actually uh, the landfill is also, sorry, it's seven sites because the landfill also surveys. These seven sites get surveyed every year. Um, so what we're hoping to do is actually tie this information to the Carner numbers. So now that we have Carner numbers that are above that recovery threshold, we really want to try and dig in a little bit deeper, understand what's driving those populations year to year and what may have caused that explosion in 2020, which was crazy. Um, so we go out, we, um, we use uh, tape to mark out these uh, 20 by 30 meter transects. Um, and then you'll see here's a little half meter quadrat in the half meter quadrats, every other half meter, we count every lupin stem. Um, for the nectar, we use two meter quadrats and we just list um, and check off if nectar, which nectar species are present. And then finally for structure, we go down that tape and use um, a vertical pole that we put along every meter along that tape and record what's touching the pole as an indication of structure. So to just give you an idea of what um, we do with this data, um, this is just some example sites. Um, you see up here at the top, we have poor, fair, good, very good. So very good is where you want to be. Um, and these are based on um, habitat metrics in the Carner recovery plan. So basically what we think that the Carners need in each of these categories in order to survive and thrive there. So uh, lupin density, summer um, nectar species richness, and also cover of grass and overstory. 
Um, so if you're in the very good area, you're going to see this nice bright green. Um, it's if you're not quite there, you're in this darker green color. So here are um, those six sites that we survey. So this doesn't include the, the landfill, um, but these are the six sites that the um, our seasonal sample. Um, and you can see for lupin stem density here, we are, we're in the very good category almost everywhere with the possible exception of this gherkin site over here, um, which we are working on to try and get the numbers back up. Um, by the way, um, we have the preserve divided into management units, um, and that's based on our fire management plan. We can only burn 50 acres at a time. So the preserve is divided into management units that are between two and 50 acres in size. And each management unit has a name. Um, and usually these names correspond to different regions. So there's a region B, a region A, a region D. Um, and so we name these units with the, all the same letters so that we know which region they're in. Um, but we come up with some pretty crazy, funny names. So if you ever see weird names or you see us or uh, our stewardship or fire team referring using these funny names, it's probably one of our management units and there's probably a funny story behind it. Um, so this is nectar species richness. Um, this is one where we're doing really well in all six of those sites. We've got plenty of nectar resources for adults. Um, and then finally, looking at overstory, this one, um, you know, you don't want too much overstory, but you don't want too little. So with overstory, there's kind of this sweet spot um, in the middle here. So most of our sites um, are doing pretty good. These um, sites are pretty good with their cover. We see Cathedral and Gherkin. Those sites have a little bit, not enough cover. They might need some more cover. Um, and that's not surprising at those two sites. Those sites are more grassy. They don't really have a whole lot of uh, shrub component to them and not a lot of pitch pine. So it's uh, not surprising that we see that we've got um, a little bit too little overstory in those sites. We also did this year surveys for frosted elfins. So this is another um, species that feeds exclusively on wild blue lupin as, uh, as caterpillars. And they are currently be, uh, being evaluated by the Fish and Wildlife Service for federal listing. So in order to contribute to our understanding of this species and its distribution, um, we have been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to conduct surveys. We do them every other year. This year was a year that we conducted surveys. So we have 12 sites um, that we go out and survey for these animals. This year we surveyed all 12 and we documented frosted elephants in nine of the 12 sites. Um, and we also this year, assisted the Fish and Wildlife Service with a genetic survey of this species because this species is found um, you know, up here in New York, down all the way to Florida. There is some curiosity about the genetics and whether or not it is in fact all one species or multiple species. So we, when we did our surveys, this is Tori collecting a genetic sample from a frosted elephant. So we would catch adults and we would take um, one little leg off the back there and um, put that in some buffer solution. And um, we took about 30 of those samples and mailed them into a lab that's going to look at the genetics of the species. So we don't have any results from that yet, but I'm kind of excited to see what we find. Um, more insect work. Um, another big project that we're doing is this pollinator RCN sampling. So this is RCN is a regional conservation needs grant. It's a federal grant and it was um, allocated for this project looking at uh, bee communities in xeric habitats and specifically hoping to find some best management practices to facilitate native bee communities in these xeric habitats. So um, you can kind of see on this poster here uh, Elizabeth Crisfield uh, presented recently. Oops, I'm trying to move my little people window. There we go. Um, you can kind of see there's a map here. So there are sites um, up in Maine, down to Virginia that are participating in this study. And what we're doing is monthly bee surveys from May through September, and also vegetation surveys. Um, and we have uh, five sites that we're monitoring. Three of those are managed sites and two of them are control sites where we will do not do any management. Um, 
And so in addition to that vegetation survey looking at habitat quality for carners, um, our seasonals also surveyed these RCN vegetation transects. Um, and there are 83 of those transects. Um, I forgot to tell you, there's 161 of the carner, um, carner habitat transects. Um, so already you can see this is, this is adding up. This is a lot of data that they collected um, for us for this season. Um, so the RCN veg, uh, method is very similar to um, what we do for the carners, except we're not super concerned with the loop intensity. Um, so uh, this was an exciting year for this project. I'm very excited. I have all of the bees pinned from the survey and ready to identify this winter. And I'm very excited because this spring we managed um, our three sites. And so this is what it looked like putting out the bowls um, for the bee survey. So in order to do the bee survey, we use two methods. One is called bee bowls, which are these small little like souffle cups. They're painted with UV paints and they're filled with soapy water. So any bees flying through the habitat are attracted to that thinking it's a flower and they fall in and then you collect the specimens at the end of the day. So these are only left out for about eight to 12 hours. Um, and the specimens are collected at the end of the day. The other method that we use is hand netting. So just using an insect net, we go and I go and um, sweep net in the site for 30 minutes catching bees. Um, and those two methods really uh, catch complementary communities of bees. It's, uh, it is unfortunate that bee sampling has to be destructive, but um, we can only identify them to species by looking at microscopic characters. So we really cannot get a handle on the bee community without knowing what species are out there. Um, so uh, again, all of our sites were managed. And when I say managed, they all received um, a mowing treatment and then a prescribed burn this spring. So this is what it looked like putting out our bee bowls. Um, and this was just a fun picture because this is a site that was burned. You can see I've, there's a lot of uh, charcoal out here, but right here in the middle is a bee nest. Um, this was a little Andrina species, and I saw her come back and plop right into that nest. So this is very, um, very soon after the burn. You can see even here, there isn't really any region quite yet. You can see the scrub oak just starting to bud back out. Um, but I'm really excited to see what the bee communities um, are going to look like in these sites after management. There's a lot of research out there right now that suggests that bees really benefit from prescribed fire. And there are certain bee species that really specialize um, in using these habitats after fire. So I'm really excited to see what we find. Um, another veg project, um, and this one we kind of tagged on at the end. Um, so they, our team was really great um, in taking things, you know, on the fly as we as we handed them, handed them out. But we are interested. Some of you, if you're familiar with the preserve, you you may notice that some of the areas where we remove locust, black locust. Um, they don't quite look like pine barrens quite yet. Um, and we've noticed that too. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out how we get those um, former locust clones to look more like barrens. Right now they're looking a little bit like grasslands, which is not bad habitat. That's great habitat and existed on this landscape historically um, in, in some amount. Um, so we probably would like to maintain some of it, but um, we have a lot of it because we've had a lot of black locust um, incursion in the pine bush in the absence of fire. And we have a lot of black locusts left to remove. So in order to kind of get a handle on this, we sent them out to former black locust clones to kind of get a handle on what scrub oak and some of our um, heaths, so blueberries, huckleberries, are those recruiting in these sites. So they went out this fall into those sites and they sampled 1,244 uh, two by five meter plots at 15 sites. Um, and they varied in age since locust clone removal. So from as early as, uh, or as old as 1999 to as recent as 20, 2018. Um, so this data is still getting entered right now. We don't have it all entered. So we don't have um, any results quite yet, um, but it was an incredible amount of work that, they, that we tagged on to the end of their season and they did really well with. And again, super excited to see what we see out there. 
All right, camera trapping. This is one of our kind of long-term monitoring projects that we do, um, and it definitely gets back burnered over the course of the season as other projects come up. Um, because the cameras, what we plan to do is move the cameras every two weeks, kind of randomly around the landscape in a treatment area that we're interested in. Um, but sometimes over the field season, when we're busy with other projects, the cameras can get left for a month or so. Um, and uh, again, we're still analyzing the data from this. Um, we have these in areas that have received management. Um, so we're looking at uh, the response of the mammal community to that management. Um, we have them in high quality pine barrens and we have them in sites that have not yet been managed. Um, again, because we want to look at that before and after to see if the mammal community changes or maybe mammal behavior, how they're using that habitat changes. Um, so far, what we have found is the mammals are everywhere in the pine bush. Um, they're not really showing a preference for one habitat or another. And in fact, they seem to use sites pretty quick after they're managed. Um, so again, hopefully upcoming, you know, and, and more results to report with this as we collect more data. The other more long-term monitoring project we have is um, hydrology mo monitoring. So this is to try and understand the hydrology of the pine bush. Um, so to do this, we have a number of these uh, test wells or piezometers that are located all over the preserve. You may see these again sometimes if you're walking along the trails. These are some newer ones that we had put in a few years ago, but there's some really old ones, especially back by the, the landfill. Um, and we go out weekly basically from uh, thaw to frost and measure the depth to the water table in these piezometers using um, these little well meters. Um, and uh, I haven't added uh, 2020 to this graph quite yet, um, and the 2020 data, 2021 data still needs to be entered. But just to give you an idea, the black line here is the total precipitation, which corresponds to this right axis over here. Um, and then this is the average depth to the water table for the different seasons um, uh, for 2014 through 2019. Um, so basically, uh, if it's a, if it's a drier season, you would expect you'd have to go further down to find the water, right? Um, versus if it's wetter, so this is a really wet year, um, we didn't have to go as far to find that, find that water. So it does vary seasonally, um, and it, um, also varies from, from year to year. Um, so getting into some more inverts. Um, we work with uh, the New York State DEC to monitor for southern pine beetle in the preserve. So southern pine beetle is uh, a species of uh, very tiny uh, pine engraver beetle. They're about the size of a grain of rice, um, and they've largely stayed south, uh, but they are moving north um, for a combination of reasons. One is climate change could be speeding up them moving north, but it's also theorized that the glaciers pushed them south, and they're still just kind of finding their way back up north since the glaciers receded. Um, so it's a species that we uh, expect to see here. Um, and in other areas where pines are very dense and maybe not as healthy because the trees are competing for resources and it's easy for these bees to get or beetles to get from one, um, one pitch pine to another, they have been pretty devastated by the invasions of these southern pine beetles. We're hoping because our pitch pines are more widely spaced. Um, it, some of you may remember we did some pitch pine thinning work over at Madison Ave. Um, hopefully that has made those pitch pines uh, healthier and more able to fend off an invasion of these beetles. And hopefully when the beetles do invade, it'll be harder for them to kind of take hold and have so, such a devastating effect. Um, so in order to monitor for these guys, we got these stacked black funnel traps and we hang lures on them. And some of these lures are the, the um, scent that a tree gives off when it's injured. And some of the lures are actually chemical scents that um, beetles will give off when they're trying to attract a mate. Um, and so we hang these lures and then hang these um, in appropriate habitat. And every, uh, every other week we go out and empty this little cup at the bottom that has collected the sample. Um, so this year we did find Southern pine beetle in the preserve, not surprising, um, but we will be working with uh, the state um, and the DEC to uh, continue monitoring um, and document their effects here in the preserve. 
Another beetle project, this is working with a researcher at the New York State Museum. Uh, he has been surveying uh, beetles in the preserve since 2015. Originally, he looked at the beetle community in sites um, with varying ages since fire. Now um, we're looking at the ground beetle community around uh, wetlands. Um, and we do that with these pitfall traps. So there's these cups that um, contain ethanol. We put a little screen over the top to exclude larger animals. So only the beetles fall, fall, fall in. And what happens is they're going through the habitat. They'll either fall directly into the trap or they'll hit this little board and walk along it and then fall into the trap. Uh, and so far with this project, um, Sam Adams, that's his name uh, at the New York State Museum, they found about 35 different species. And what's really interesting is these are our three sites where we're surveying around wetlands. Um, and they're very close together. These, I mean, uh, um, this is right on the yellow trail behind the Discovery Center, if anybody's familiar. Um, and these, so these sites are fairly close together, but what's interesting is they all seem to have very distinct beetle communities, which is interesting. This one is what we would call um, a beautiful Pine Barrens Vernal Pond. This one is more kind of an open pond, like an open water body, not a lot of submergent vegetation. Um, and then this one is a restoration uh, wetland that's kind of in the process of, of being created. So it's interesting that we're seeing uh, distinct communities. Um, also, this data, while it's informing us here at the Pine Bush, is also we're following the methods for a larger survey of ground beetles and wetlands that's being done by NEON, which is the National Ecological Observatory Network. And the same expert that's IDing beetles for that project is also IDing our beetles. Um, so what we're finding is kind of, um, yeah, they're distinct communities. We're also seeing species that um, are specialists uh, in sand dune habitats or more sandy habitats. Um, so this is a, a really interesting project that we're looking forward to seeing the final report for. All right, so now I'll get into birds. How am I doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. So now I'll get into birds. Um, we do a lot of bird research in the pine bush um, because we have a lot of birds um, and we have a lot of specialist birds. So um, the one of the main things that we do are these bird point count surveys. And these are trail side surveys, which means you may have encountered these. Um, they're a little piece of rebar with an orange cap on it. Sometimes in order to find them, we will put blue tape um, around trees or branches near that point count. These are permanently located points so that we can survey the same point from year to year and we can look to see if the community of birds changes. So what we do with these points, is we stand there and we listen and we watch and we write down every bird that we hear or see um, for a 10 minute period. Um, and what that kind of gives us is a rudimentary estimate of abundance, how many of these different species might be on the landscape. Um, it can tell us about the communities of birds. So are, the, are there distinct communities to our different habitat types? Some of these are in more forested areas. Some of them are in those former locust clones. Some of them are in high quality barrens. So do we see differences in the bee community? And do we also, bird community, and do we also see that community change as we restore and manage that habitat? Um, so in an ideal year, we would like to get six to eight of these point counts in. It was a really tricky season. We had a lot of other research going on and the weather wasn't super cooperative. So this year we were only able to get three point counts done, um, which we have three surveyors. So we each got to each, uh, we, we went to each point three times. So um, it's good that we all got to the points once, um, but it's not as much data as we would have wanted, but uh, it's the base amount and uh, that data has just been entered. So again, looking forward to seeing what we learn. We also bur banned birds in the preserve and this is to dig a little bit deeper into the bird data. So whereas the point count data tells us about the community and maybe abundances, the bird banding can tell us about productivity. So um, are these animals successfully reproducing in this habitat or um, in, in the case of our fall migration station, are these animals using this continually? Are we getting the same community of species that are using this year to year as a stopover during migration? So in order to do this, um, we use these mist nets, which are fine nets that we string between um, conduit poles. Again, if you hike in the preserve, you've probably seen these conduit poles, especially in Carner Barrens East, that's where our fall migration station is. So you may have encountered these walking around in the preserve. 
and they're they're passive nets. So basically, we um, we string them up. We hope the birds um, there's birds around. They fly into the nets because they don't see them when they're flying through the habitat. We come around every half hour or hour, depending on the weather, extract the birds, um, and bring them back to a central location where we will age and sex the birds. We'll look at different qualities um, that are indicators of health, such as feather wear and um, fat content. Um, and most importantly, we will put a small band on their leg and that band has a unique number on it so that we're giving that bird uh, a unique identifier so that if we catch it again or someone else catches it, we can start to learn where they're migrating to and from, where do they breed, how long do they live, um, we can start to, that's where we can start to dig into that productivity question. So this year, um, we were able, again, in 2020, due to uh, COVID, we were not able to run our MAPS bird banding station. So uh, it was good to get that started up again this season. Um, but we did... Um, mow and burn <laughs> our whole banding station. So not only does that probably not look as um, enticing to birds in the area right after management, um, but it also increases the visibility of the nets. So it's kind of a double blow for our catch rates. So we only caught 168 birds um, over a uh, seven days at our MAP station this year. MAPS stands, by the way, for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. It's a continent-wide uh, protocol that's used all over uh, the United States and North America. Um, and so while it tells us about productivity, we also submit this data to a larger database to understand uh, th what these species are doing range wide. And these, this program actually is um, partnering now with MOSI in South America that's looking at overwintering survivorship. Um, so now we're connecting the breeding grounds with the wintering grounds. So pretty exciting. So it wasn't a super exciting year for our map station because of the management. Um, so only 168 birds, 89% uh, of them were new, only 9.5% were recaps. That's not surprising, especially considering that we didn't actually band any last year. Um, and for those of you doing the math, yes, some of them were unbanded. And those are birds that we don't have a permit to band, like ruby-throated hummingbirds, or birds that uh, got away from us while we were handling them, either at the net or the banding tent. Um, a little over half of our birds were hatch year birds. HY stands for hatch year. That means they hatched out of the egg this year leaving about 43% um, that were after hatch year. So those are older birds that include second and third year birds um, and, and up. Um, and then again, there are some that we are not able to age um, or got away from us. And we caught 26 different species at our map station. Fall migration was a little bit more successful. So for fall migration, we captured 626 birds. Um, that was 88% new bands. Um, it's a little interesting because usually, um, usually we have more new bands in the fall migration. So those are new captures, not recaptures. We usually have a little bit higher proportion of recaps at our breeding areas as opposed to our um, migration station because these birds, if they're successful, they're going to come back. But I think what drove down our recap number here was both our catch rate and the fact that we didn't actually band there the year before. Um, so we did get some recaps during fall migration, even those recaps sometimes are resident birds, a lot of chickadees that hit the nets multiple times, um, and 4% were unbanded. Uh, large proportion of hatch years in the fall, which is not surprising because we're catching all of the, the results of successful breeding up north of us. So um, we usually see a, a pretty high ratio of hatch years. Um, and we caught 62 species during our fall migration. Uh, for our Northern Sawit Owl Banding Station. So this is part of Project OwlNet. It's looking at migration of this uh, nomadic species. Um, so again, uh, this is contributing to our understanding of how migrating birds use the pine bush, um, but also gets added to this larger database for this species. Um, 
we didn't have a great season for sawwets uh, at the pine bush. We had an extremely warm fall. Some of you may remember that October was unseasonably warm. We had a lot of south winds. Um, and so not only do the south winds kind of prevent them from moving, but if it's warm, they don't really need to move. Um, so basically these guys, these species really only moves when they need to they'll go as far south as they need to to find food. So if it's really warm and there's plenty of food, they're not really gonna move much. Um, so while in previous years, we've caught as many as 37 over 13 nights, this year we only caught uh, six birds over uh, 10 nights. So it was a very slow season for us with the, with the sawwet owls. This was one of our better nights here. You can kind of see the size difference here. This is a male. He was the smallest bird we've ever captured and this was a big female. Um, you can tell their sex by looking at a combination of their wing, the length of their wing and their weight. So the females are bigger and way more than the males. This was actually the smallest bird we've ever banded. Um, the females usually weigh between 95 and 100 grams and this little male only weighed 72. So he was a little peanut. Um, also with birds, we have upgraded our MODIS tower. Um, actually, I should say towers. So um, this is the new location of um, our big beast, we call it. So this is the MODIS tower that is on the frequency um, that most of uh, the uh, Western hemisphere is using. Um, so it's 176 megahertz. Um, and when I say frequency, so what I mean is, um, back in the day when we used to do radio telemetry, you'd put a tag on an animal and then you would take out an antenna and you would take a number of readings around where that animal is to kind of pinpoint where they are at a given time. Um, so this has kind of taken that radio telemetry thing and really blown it up huge. And instead of having people on the ground walking around with antennas, we've mounted the antennas on roofs or towers. And then when tagged animals are within the range of these antennas, it records that data as a hit. Um, so this one captures animals that have um, tags, radio tags that are tuned to the frequency of 167 megahertz. We've also added another frequency. So we have another um, tower uh, located in a different spot on the roof that is, I think it's 464 megahertz. I'm probably wrong, but it's somewhere around there. So it's a little bit of a different frequency. And the reason that people are kind of branching into this new frequency is because there are a limited number of tags that can be put on the 167 megahertz frequency. And so we're already, because so many people are using this as a tool to study animal movement, um, we're actually running out of tags and we're starting to recycle tags. And so there's this movement to move to this new frequency, which has essentially an unlimited number of tags that you would be able to put on that frequency. So right now we're running both frequencies on our roof. <clears throat> so we have two towers, which makes me the Lord of the pings. Um, that's what we call it. So we call it a ping when a bird hits the tower. So I like to refer to myself as the Lord of the pings. Um, and uh, this tower, because it's bigger, is um, Baradur and the other one is Orthanc. For anyone who are Lord of the Rings fans, I hope you appreciate that. <clears throat> so this fall, we've had eight flyovers. So these are not birds that we tagged. These are birds that other researchers tagged. These um, MODIS, this, the MODIS network is made up of hundreds of these um, antennas. And basically when a person puts the radio tag on the bird it, and it flies south through the winter, it hits these tags or it hits these towers as um, it flies if it's within the range of them. And so we are adding to this network that's helping inform the species movement. Um, and in this case, the Southern migration of these species. So we got a bobolink in August. Um, then we got black-throated blue warblers and Swainson's thrushes in September, uh, another late Swainson's thrush in October. And then here in November, I kind of thought things were wrapping up, but early November, we got a rusty blackbird. Oh, I got pictures here, here you go. Um, and then I just realized today that we got an American pipit that flew over. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's not a super common species around here. It's definitely more common in the winter months, um, but kind of a cool, kind of a cool thing. 
Now, the other reason that we added this new frequency to our MODIS tower was because we wanted to take advantage of another project. Um, and this is through cellular tracking technologies. Um, they've created these little nodes and each one of these is like a, an antenna receiver and it communicates the data that it gets back to the MODIS tower on our roof. So each one of these, it's about, you know, it's, it's about that big. Um, and we have them mounted. Um, this is what they look like when they're mounted. They're just on the eight foot conduit poles. Um, there's a little solar panel on top and a little antenna. Um, and any data that this receives, it transmits via a cellular data network back to our MODIS tower so that we can download the data. So again, it's really kind of automating this radio telemetry stuff, which is awesome because radio telemetry was an incredible amount of work. It was a lot of boots on the ground. And even when you pinpointed the location of an animal, it would move two minutes later, right? It was extremely difficult to do. So um, we've put out this grid of these nodes and they all communicate with our MODIS tower. So we've got, th we put out 33 of these nodes this summer and we put radio tags on towhees, Eastern towhees. Um, we did this because they're a really uh, common bird in the pine bush. They're a good indicator of pitch pine scrub oak barrens um, and they're very numerous out there. And so this is what these little tags look like. You can see even the tags have little solar panels on them. Um, so we don't have to worry about a battery, which usually adds a lot of weight to these tags. So these are very lightweight tags. Um, it's, it, the bird is wearing it kind of like a backpack. So there's two little loops that go over the legs and then the tag sits right here on the rump. And then this is the antenna. Um, and so we tagged 10 towies with these tags in our node network. Um, and then every time those towies were within range of those nodes, that data was communicated back to our uh, MODIS tower. So this is another really exciting project. I'm super excited to see what we find from this. Um, Steve did do a rudimentary analysis. He's probably gonna kick me for sharing this with you, but it's pretty cool. And I mean, I think this is what the data is going to look like. Um, so the black dots on this map um, so this is like, there's, there's no, um, there's not a lot of identifying characters under here, but these black dots, this is the grid of nodes that we put out. So these are all of our nodes. Okay. Now all of these little colored dots, each color is one of our toeys. So here are the, the 10 tag IDs for our 10 toeys. So each one of these colors is a toey. So it's pretty cool, right? Like there they are. This one, this guy's stuck right here. This, and this is what we were kind of interested in with towies was because there are so many of them, how do they maintain, ter maintain territories? Do they maintain territories or do they just completely overlap? Um, and we're seeing a lot of overlapping happening here, but um, this is what I kind of think the data is going to look like. And we're going to look at that over the course of the season. So we're going to see, you know, where they were defending territories early in the season. Maybe we'll see what, um, if they moved around later in the season where after the, the nestlings have fledged. Um, and we were able to see that these guys stuck around in the area until like mid-October um, and, and then they left. So we're not picking them up in our node network anymore. We, were, we are hopeful that they're good picked up by other um, MODIS towers, um, but we haven't got them picked up on any yet. So still hoping, keeping my fingers crossed. Um, some other projects, some other bird projects were Eastern whippoorwill. So this is a, a species of greatest conservation need um, that we are seeing return to the pine bush, which is really exciting. Again, um, we want to try and facilitate them coming back to the pine bush. This was a species that was here historically in great numbers. Um, neighbors have spoken about these birds keeping them up at night because they just sing continuously. Um, so this is a species that we're trying to understand a little bit better. This is a species we would really like to put those tags that we put on the towies. We would like to put them on these, um, but we're experimenting with the towies first to see what it looks like. Um, and if, if it works and it's a good system, then we'll be expanding it and hopefully using that same system on whippoorwills. Right now, what we're using are GPS tags. So these are tags that communicate with GPS satellites, but unfortunately we need to recapture the birds to uh, get any data. And I, I can't show you any data because none of these punks wanted to come back in the net after getting caught once. So we tagged 
three Eastern whippoorwills with GPS tags um, in the preserve this year. And we're pretty sure we relocated them all, but none of them would come back in the net. And so I was gonna play this for you. This is... You can actually hear two whippoorwills singing. One of them is the audio recording that we use to lure them into the net. The other one is the actual bird sitting in a tree right above the audio recording, basically saying he doesn't care and he's not going to get back in the net. Um, so our hope is that these birds will return next year and that we will be able to get these tags off of them next spring when they come back um, and that we'll be able to get the data then. <laughs> That's the hope. <laughs> Um, also, uh, this year, I was able to attend, thanks to support from our friends of the Pine Bush community, I was able to attend a workshop to learn how to band hummingbirds. Um, these are species, this, this is one of the species that we're not currently permitted to band. Um, so it's one of the, the unbanded ones that we have to let go when we catch them in our nets. Um, our hope is that after attending this workshop, we'll be able to add these to our permit. Um, you can see the little teeny tiny band here. Their bands are much smaller. Um, this is actually the toe of like a stocking that we put them in to process them. Um, so it's just, they're much uh, more fragile animal. The bands are much smaller. Um, you just have to be a little bit more careful. So I went to this training um, and I banded almost 150 of them. So got some great experience and hoping that we can add that to our permit next year. And then finally, I just I did want to touch a little bit on herps because it seems like it's a group that we're not really working with. Um, but we are we're, we're trying we're desperately trying to work with them. Uh, so this is a smooth green snake. Um, we have these in the preserve, but we don't really understand their distribution and why they're why they're where they are, or what their habitat requirements are. But um, it turns out they're super difficult to encounter. Um, we tried to using um, a, a grid of cover boards out there, but we have not encountered any under our cover boards. So we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board there. So I guess this is a good example too of, you know, sometimes the research doesn't um, go as planned. Sometimes we don't get the data that we're hoping for. Um, so this is a, a species that we're, we're still kind of trying to, to figure out. We just need to figure out a good way to encounter them so we can start learning about them. Right now we only encounter, you know, maybe one or two a year, and that's just not enough to draw any conclusions from. The other animal that we uh, survey for regularly is the Eastern Spadefoot Toad. Uh, this is a species that's fossorial, meaning it spends most of its life underground. And they really, you really only encounter them when they come out for breeding events. Um, and so we basically go out uh, every time it's a possibility for a breeding event. And that includes a lot of rain. The water table needs to be high enough. Um, it needs to be raining. It needs to be a pretty big, strong, low pressure system moving through. Um, and we just have not been able, it's the last time we had a breeding event of these animals was 2012. And we thought for sure with all our rain this year that we were gonna have them pop up, but we have not been able to encounter them. So herps are on, um, on our radar. We, we are hoping to, to learn more about them. And they have been on our radar previously too. So we've done a lot of work with herps historically also. All right, and with that, I think I covered everything. I'm just gonna check my notes, make sure. Oh, you know what I didn't mention about the RCNB project um, was that the pine bush currently has um, detected 111 species of bees for that project. And that is the most of any site um, that's participating. So pretty proud of that. Um, yeah, and I think that's everything. So with that, again, kudos to our team here. Um, and thanks to, to my coworkers and the, the Pine Bush staff that make all this possible. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Let's see. Don, regarding the bird point count stations, what is the proficiency of the folks IDing the birds? Um, that's a good question, Don. So we, we um, do that in-house. So it's Neil, Steve, and myself um, that, know, that do those point counts because you need to know every bird by sight and sound that you're gonna, that's possible to detect in the pine bush. And there's about, there's probably over a hundred species that breed in the pine bush. Um, and yes, we have trouble sometimes. Like we, sometimes well, I'll take a recording of a bird 
Um, and then I'll try to go hunt it down so I can see it visually. Sometimes I'll take a recording of a bird and then we'll play it. We'll meet together as a group after the point count is done and try to figure out what we heard. Um, but yeah, you have to, you have to be pretty proficient with your bird sight and sound in order to do those surveys. Um, how many hours at night do you spend to capture sawwits? Oh, good question, Don. So um, it's five hours up until um, daylight savings hits, and then we get an extra hour. So it's five hours or six hours that we run the nets for the sawwits. Um, let's see. Looks like there's some in the... There's a photo of a bridge under construction. Please let us know more about this. Yeah, so um, this bridge is actually um, this. I, I, I joke because um, there's this, you know, this bullet on the job description that says other duties as assigned. So this isn't really science work, um, but this was a pretty big effort to build this large bridge. This is because we're rerouting some trail over in the Great Dune area. Um, Basically, the National Grid prefers us to not have um, sanctioned trails underneath the power line right of ways. So there will be a rerouting of the trails in the Great Dune area, specifically the red, I think it's the red trail that goes right underneath the power line, uh, or it might be yellow, it might be yellow. Um, but anyway, that's gonna get bumped. So you just cross the power line, not walk along the power line. And in order to do that, um, we had this huge ravine that we needed to cross. Um, so this was spearheaded by stewardship, um, so by Jesse Hoffman and his staff, um, but we everybody kind of pitched in to get this thing built because it was kind of, it was a pretty big span that we needed to get across. So they helped uh, build that bridge for like about a week. Let's see the Eastern Spadefoot has it not bred in nine years. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm pretty sure I have gone out pretty much every time. I mean, they're, they're a very fun species to encounter. Um, and so, and I live fairly close to the pine bush. And so I would go out anytime it was raining. Um, and so I feel like if they had had a breeding event, we would have detected it. And also the staff that are doing the, the restoration at the landfill uh, also regularly do surveys for spadefoots and they have not detected them either. So yes, it is it is getting a little bit concerning that they have not had a breeding event because we, we basically haven't repl replenished the population in nine years. Yeah, it's concerning, I'm concerned. Um, can the cellular technology project be utilized to track Eastern whippoorwills? Yeah, yeah, it can, um, Scott. The only problem is, is that uh, the, the whippoorwills need to be where the nodes are, or we need to put the nodes where the whippoorwills are. Um, and so that's why um, in order, and the nodes need to be within about a kilometer of the MODIS tower. So that's why we wanted to kind of see how this project worked with TOEIs. Um, because if we were to try and do this with whippoorwills, we might need to install a couple more modus towers in the preserve in order to have the nodes grid be within range. Um, so yes, our hope, our hope is that we would be able to use this um, for Eastern whippoorwills. Are you doing native seed collection? Yes, we do do native seed collection. It doesn't fall on the science department to do that collection. Um, the stewardship department manages that. Um, they do um, in-house collection and they also train volunteers to do native seed collection. So Jesse Hoffman runs a training every year where he teaches people how to recognize the plants that we wanna collect seeds from and basically sends them out with the materials to collect that seed. So yes, we do collect native seed. Let's see. Have you tried to band American woodcocks specifically? Uh, Colleen, we have not. Um, we do catch them incidentally occasionally in our um, nets when we open up in the mornings. Um, and if we do catch them incidentally, we do ban them. Um, but we have not looked at them in particular. There is a researcher at um, Cobleskill University that does work with American woodcocks. Um, and he has uh, kind of played around with the idea of doing some research in the pine bush with the woodcocks um, because they are a species that also seems to be doing particularly well in the pine bush. Um, and we know that because we have volunteers that go out and do call surveys for them um, in, in April. 
um, and our counts are at or above what they see in other areas when they do the singing ground survey with the Fish and Wildlife Service does the singing ground survey for them. So um, we seem to have a pretty healthy population of them. Um, so yeah, maybe in the future. What about bats? Have they been monitored over the years? I haven't seen bats in my neighborhood in a long time. That's a great question, Don. Um, yes, we did do, I'm trying to think what year it was now. I can check. We did do um, surveys for bats. Let me exit out of that. I'll stop my share. And let me see if I can just find that real quick. Um, in order to do the, the surveys for bats, we um, contracted out to a company. And what they did was put microphones around the preserve in different areas. Let's see, bats. So it looks like 2015 was the last year we surveyed the bats and we put these microphones up and then they record um, the, the sonar, the, the calls of the bats um, all, all night long. And then they analyze the sonograms of those calls because you can identify species from the sonograms. Um, and so when we did that survey, we found kind of what we expected. Um, lots of lots of big brown bats. Um, and a couple of the more rare species, but um, yeah, with the white nose kind of ravaging the area, um, the, the bat numbers have declined. I'm not surprised you have noticed a difference. Um, what type of bat is in the picture? Oh yeah, great. Yeah, let me put that back up. So this bat here, this is kind of funny The the, um, the staff were actually, this was out, this was when they were out surveying um, the scrub oak. So they were doing that survey of um, woody recruitment in the former locust clones. And they happened to look up and it was a really windy day. This is an Eastern red bat. Um, and it, it was just hanging on on the scrub oak above them. It was probably migrating um, and just stopped for a rest during the day. So that's an Eastern red bat. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Bye, Stephen. Do the pine beetles attack any other types of trees and has there been any damage noticed in the area? Um, they do attack more. They're, they they um, will attack any pines, basically. I think they've, they've even, I think they've even seen them down on Long Island um, branching out and attacking spruces. Um, so yes, they will attack other pines. Um, predominantly what we have is the pitch pine and then some areas of white pine. Um, so yes, they will attack other things. Um, I don't believe we have noticed any damage from them um, yet. The idea that we did get some in our traps, but it was very late in the season. So I think the idea is that these are kind of experimental. These are ones that kind of either drifted north or they're trying it out. Um, and um, most, of the, most of what's kept these beetles south is um, cold winter temperatures. So it's possible if we have a cold winter, all these beetles that we found will not make it through the, through the winter anyway. Um, uh, but yeah, we are, we do keep an eye out for damage. Um, DEC actually does um, flyovers and helicopters over on target areas to look for um, damage to pitch pines uh, or any pines really. And then on the ground, um, you can see damage. They, um, when the, when the trees are attacked, they put out, um, it's called popcorning. It's like, they're trying to push the beetles out. And what you end up with is all these little popcorn kernels of resin on the sides of the trees. Um, but other native beetles can make that happen too. Um, so, all right, uh, Michael, and are there any bird species that are considered invasive that threaten the CBB? What is CBB, Michael? Um, okay, um, are there any bird species that are considered invasive? So the um, probably the ones that would most be considered invasive in this area would be the European starling and the house sparrow. Um, and they are pro uh, problematic um, for our native bird species that are cavity nesters. So a lot of times that's that's bluebirds. So they, they butt heads with bluebirds a lot um, and they'll 
you know, so bluebirds is a native species. It's our state bird. Um, and they were in pretty heavy decline. Um, I think they're doing much better now, but, um, part of that decline was that they were getting pushed out by, uh, European starlings and, uh, house sparrows. Oh, the Carner blue. Okay. Gotcha. Um, no, I think that predation on, um, Carners by birds is probably, probably negligible. They're pretty small. Um, I'm sure that these insectivorous birds would um, eat a carner blue if presented with the opportunity, um, but I, I don't I don't think it's much of a meal for them. I'm, I'm not sure that that's what they're really going for, because really they're mostly wings. And then once you once you get the wings off, it's a pretty tiny sausage. Um, so, um, no, I don't think that we are have any concerns about any invasive uh, birds pr um, preying on the carners. Good questions. Have you noticed any fluctuations in bobolink populations over the years? They winter in Argentina. Um, so I'm not sure, Don. Um, we don't actually have any bobolinks um, breeding in the preserve. Um, I think they are occasionally uh, documented on the landfill because it's a big grassy area, but they usually don't stick around. They're more of a grassland species and they need pretty big, wide, continuous patches of, of, of continuous grassland um, in order to like, persist on the landscape. So uh, they are not a species that we follow in the pine bush. Um, Range-wide anecdotally, because they are a grassland bird, I believe they are in decline um, because grassland habitat is very much in decline. We've lost a lot of grassland habitat. Um, so yeah, I think uh, probably range-wide they have, yeah, experienced declines. Right. Any other questions? If anybody, if any of you know, you know, I post these seasonal jobs in um, usually in March. We hire seasonal jobs for educators, um, for fire. Um, fire techs uh, for uh, stewardship uh, seasonals. So these positions usually get posted in, I think there's actually an education position posted right now. The um, stewardship and fire jobs, I think get posted in January. The science jobs get posted in March. Um, so if you know anybody who's interested, really like to target these positions to um, people in an undergrad program, in, a, in an environmental program, or just kind of finished up an environmental program so that they um, can build their resumes because this is a lot of different uh, technical field skills that they gain from this job. So really like it to be a resume builder for, for um, newbies in the field. Would it help with all the myriad of work you do to have more staff? I mean, <laughs> sure, <clears throat> we still, you know, yeah, we have more staff, we could collect more data, but you know, at some point then you have so much data to, to process, then that actually becomes your limiting factor. Um, so yeah, I think there's at some point you're like, yeah, we can get more data, but um, do we have the capacity to, to utilize it or analyze it and um, produce stuff from it. Yeah, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure that hits kind of a level <clears throat> where it's not not super productive anymore. Um, I feel like we have a good balance right now. Um, you know, we've got a lot of projects on the back burner. We also really like to work with other science institutions. Um, so other agencies, other um, uh, universities uh, to provide opportunities for students or researchers that are looking for graduate work or um, that usually works out really well because we're able to learn um, from that, but we don't have to um, manage the data collection on our end. Um, that works really well. Oh, thank you. Wendy posted albanypinebush.org slash jobs. All right, folks, well, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes in case any other questions pop up. But thank you again so much for joining. I hope uh, 
I hope it was enlightening um, and I hope you enjoyed.